Welcome guys. So what we're going to do today is look at social policy and sociology and look at the relationship between the two. This relates to A-level sociology, second year, looking at theory and methods um, and is going to cover some basics about theory and look at some exams questions at the end. One thing to keep in mind is if you've got your sociology pack, PowerPoints, all the materials that we use in lesson, um, this PowerPoint will run alongside them. So do use this to help consolidate your knowledge. So let's get underway. So the first thing to do, let's get stuck into this, is think about social policy. Now, a social policy is a plan or action put in place by a government to tackle a social problem. So what I like to do is I like to think about what social policies we have discussed from the topics we've covered so far from family, education and beliefs. There is an extension here where you can start thinking about what these policies were generally trying to tackle. So a couple of points here. I'm going to give you just a few seconds and then I'm going to click on. So if you want to pause the video here, have a go at coming up with your list and then we'll go through the answers in just a second. So I'll give you a little countdown. Three, two, one. Here we go. So this is the list of all, sorry, some, but not all of those policies that I mentioned previously. So for family, we saw Civil Partnership Act, Gay Marriage, Divorce Reform Act, you know, a lot of the policies we saw either change the structure of family by changing divorce proceedings, making it easier, quicker, or slowing the process down. We saw changes in family structure with civil partnerships, gay marriage, adoption. We saw changes in the role of women with equal pay, sex discrimination, marital rape ban. So loads of policies came in. And ultimately, the, the impact of policies was always going to be to increase diversity, or maintain traditional values. That seemed to be the way most policies in, uh, in family took place. In education, again, some policies that linked to education. Ultimately, these policies changed the education system and its structure. They were either designed to increase inclusion and equality by bringing in more benefits, more support, more um, uh, sort of flexibility in education or they went the other way where they actually inadvertently increased inequality. And actually a lot of the early policies like tripartite, comprehensivization, education reform act, they were designed to make education better, to make it more equal, but inevitably all of them made it less equal. What we can also see, and I think a big difference with spot as we go, is that labor governments tend to give more welfare support. So in terms of education, Lots of encouragement, lots of welfare support, lots of provisions to improve education. The Conservatives came into power in 2010 and I think almost all the policies that were making education more inclusive, like EMA, Aim Higher, Sure Start, um, were all almost immediately scrapped or cut. And lastly, beliefs. Now, again, religion and policy, there isn't massive amounts of overlap, not direct policies anyway. But I thought there were some indirect. So the changes to same sex relationships, female bishops, the prevent policies all have fringe connections to religion. Equality Act also thought about the change of adding veganism to one of the protected characteristics um, under discrimination. So it has a link to NAMS and new ecology. So not as many policies directly linked to beliefs, but some kind of sort of consequential impacts. Well, I also thought about the, the impact of growth of use of food banks, homelessness because of austerity. Government have cut a lot of the support programs that were funded, funded sorry, to provide support. And the church has, has kind of filled the gap in some places where it can um, for social welfare support. Now, what we need to think about is the difference between a social problem and a sociological problem. Now, this is all discussed in your pack, but the main point here is that a social problem is something that causes harm to society. Most of society sees it as a problem. Um, however, what is considered a social problem is not always agreed by all members of society. So generally, the idea of a social problem is something that causes harm to society and a majority, a lot of people in society see it as a problem, but it doesn't always have to be everyone. A sociological problem is different. A sociological problem is something that sociologists are considered or interested in. Now, most, almost all social problems will be a sociological problem, but not every sociological problem is a social problem. So I will explain what I mean by that in a second. So what we're doing, we're trying to put this in a context. We think about an example. So let's say prostitution 
is a social problem. Could it be a sociological problem as well? And let's take a look. So this is an activity that you can pause the screen and have a think about. You can alternatively choose your own social problem. So if we think about this, what would the following groups say about prostitution? What would the community say? What would the prostitutes themselves say? The clients, the government, how would they look at this social problem and how would they explain it? Now, you can choose your own social problem, but have a think about how each community might view prostitution in their area. What would they say about it? Do they consider it a problem? Would it be something they're interested or concerned about? Just some alternative social problems you can think about would be domestic violence, homelessness, uh, not so much gun control in the UK, but you know, if you're, you know, it could be one to consider thinking about gun control in the US. Women entering politics, social inequality, um, or monarchy, if you wanted to look at that, prostitution, which we're going to look at, euthanasia, and gangsterism. These are all social problems. But not all of them are sociological. So sociologists would be interested in maybe domestic violence with homelessness, uh, women in politics. Actually, to us, sociologists would probably be considered interested in all of these. But the ones that are social problems, the ones that society is generally concerned about. So UK isn't worried about gun control. Homelessness doesn't seem to be a major priority for many people in the UK. Um, euthanasia doesn't seem to be a big issue for many people in the UK. So again, it's the difference between a social and a sociological problem. Um, there is another good documentary, again, that links to prostitution, demonstrating it, and I think it's worth watching if you want to. It, again, just as a caution, there are some discussions and scenes of drug use, of violence, sexual activity, and a lot of swearing. It is on the iPlayer, it's only about 16 minutes long, it's a whole series of them, but they are interesting to look at because it highlights that issue of social policy, social problems, and from a sociological point of view, there's, there's some interesting ideas that arise. So again, I'll leave the link for that in the description below. So let's look at the wider perspective. Now, prostitution, the communities that, that live in the area would probably be uh, unhappy with the level of prostitution in the area. The clients, um, you know, they, they get something from prostitution, so they're probably not going to be critical of it. The government tends to be critical of prostitution because it is seen as, as encouraging other crime in the area. But legally, it's a bit of a grey area because it's not illegal to be um, a prostitute and to sell sex or sexual services. Um, but it's the idea that you can't solicit those services in public or on the street. That's the kind of difference. Also, there's rules about how many people can work in areas, so like brothels. Um, that's where we see illegal prostitution taking place. But what I also want to think about is the wider context. So thinking about theories and political views, how they might view it. Um, feminism is in some cases positive of and supportive of prostitution, because again, it's the idea that these are women, they are sex workers, they need to be rights, they need to be protected. Um, politically, sort of Labour when it's under Corbyn, um, that decriminalization of prostitution. So women who were prostitutes who were arrested or prostitution to be decriminalized as an act uh, on the basis that these women you know, are victims or they need support or are trying to earn a living because of well, the inability to do it in other ways. You might have MPs who are very critical into prostitution and, and almost actively try to make it illegal or push for sanctions on prostitution inadvertently being discovered to be using prostitutes along the side. Uh, local areas, you know, the Holbeck documentary, if you've watched it, the managed area for prostitution uh, that they had, obviously a lot of people in the area critical of it, but it, in, the idea being it kind of was a, a way of controlling prostitution. And globally, Europe and different parts of the world have different rules on prostitution. Now, looking at political strategies, the left and the right wing, again, these images come from the TES and I will pop links in the bottom for these. Um, but if you think about the political spectrum, you've got the left and the right. Left would be kind of Labour, far left would be Green. You go even further left, you're pushing to socialism, communism as the extreme. On the right wing, you will see 
Conservatives or Tory governments, you'll see UKIP as further right. The far right would be fascism and extremism. Um, central is generally liberal party. Liberal uh, kind of would be kind of fairly central, neutral, um, but they tend to swing between the left and the right. Now, these are kind of differences between left and right wing policy. What's interesting on a global perspective is that we talk about left and right wing in the UK, but what politically we found is that compared to a majority of Europe, our left wing is still quite further right. So most political parties, most political um, sort of spectrums across Europe are actually further left than our Labour Party. So most European governments are quite left leaning. If anything, we are the kind of the extreme right version of politics. And then you go to the sort of Conservatives and UKIP, you're even on the most most radical extreme right compared to other parts of the Europe. Now, just to put this in a different context, again, placing political perspectives in Coca-Cola cans. Um, again, this is from the TES, link will be in the description. But I thought this was a, a way of understanding it differently. So we put Liberal Democrats in the centre, Coke Zero. So the taste of regular Coke, but the lack of sugar of Diet Coke. So it's quite central. The best of both. If you go to the right, you've got the Conservative Party. So the full traditional Coke, the original kind of Coke, full sugar, old fashioned values or old style. Um, not necessarily completely uh, fitting in with today's society, particularly think about the, sort of the, the views on healthy lifestyle now um, doesn't always fit the modern society, but that's traditional Coke. And then the further, right? So uh, I've gone with UKIP, not that just it's purple, but cherry Coke. Um, so it's, it's like the right, like the conservatives, very similar, but there's one unique thing that separates them, which is in was UKIP was their position on the EU. They've now changed to become the reform party. So they've got one policy, one agenda. And again, so it's, it's the conservative is the right leaning, but with something unique. On the left, we've got Labour. Now Labour will be the Diet Coke. So very almost the opposite of the Conservative Party. Um, you know, it's, it's the stripped back sugar version. Now Corbyn's Labour was be like Pepsi Max. So slightly different, same sort of thing, same premise. It's Diet Coke, but it's a slightly different style. Um, I think with Keir Starmer, we're kind of moving back towards traditional Diet Coke. And then the left, the Green Party would be like Coke Life. So it's again, like le left leaning, but it's a very specific point to them, a bit like you give. So it's about Coke Life and kind of being green. Now, political ideology is very different. So you've got the left and the right wing, as I mentioned before. Some, some left wing stuff here. So Labour's government under Tony Blair was heavily influenced by the work of Giddens as a late modernist thinker. Uh, very pro-diversity, so we saw lots of changes to family structures, to education, lots of pro-diversity approaches. Now, Labour was still kind of traditional values and mainstream uh, education, marketization, still pro, uh, sort of quite popular, but they brought in a lot of measures to include everyone or try to include everyone. Also, what you can see on the diagram is what left-leaning voters tend to believe. So minimum wage, there's lots of uh, nationalization, supporting uh, people with benefits and welfare. Um, this will be what the left voters tend to prioritize. Now, as an op contrast, you can see what the right voters tend to prioritise. So again, it's almost the opposite. Benefits are too high. Um, that you know we shouldn't nationalise public services. Tuition fees shouldn't be given to students. Um, uh, support the UK having nuclear weapons. School is not strict enough. There's too much immigration. Crime is too uh, high and needs to be tough. Now, Conservative Party is like. Um, that of Margaret Thatcher, are heavily influenced by new right thinkers. So Charles Murray heavily influenced the work of Margaret Thatcher. As a wider comparison, again, you can pause this and take a look at it in your own time. Um, but left and right wing, there is a bit of a divide between the two, particularly in stuff like um, 
the NHS. So left-leaning voters say that the NHS should have less privatisation. Right-leaning thinkers tend to kind of disagree. The kind of the closest similarity between the two would be that um, that doctors should have the legal power to end the life of terminally ill patients. That's the only kind of very clear similarity between left and right thinkers. And again, that comes back to that very beginning of a social issue. Uh, but again, this, these are the differences between left and right thinkers. Now, Tony Blair's new Labour was seen as a bit of a blurring between left and right. So um, this is why Corbyn's Labour in recent years has been say, seen as so radical because it was a shift to a far more left leaning party. With Keir Starmer in charge now, we might see a slightly more uh, central Labour Party, so maybe moving towards a little bit more towards the sort of the Blair centralism that we've seen in the past. But there's a lot of criticism for Tony Blair basically being conservative in Labour clothing, really. Now, just to talk about Giddens again, Giddens said that sociologists are divided as to whether there should be a relationship between sociology and policy. Some argue that sociology should be used to directly influence governments and bring about reform. Others say that sociology is an academic subject and it has no use or value uh, to be involved in policy. Now, Giddens argues that sociology can be useful in enabling social policy for a number of ways. So he talks about understanding society, having an awareness of cultural differences and increasing uh, self-knowledge and awareness of the issues. One such example of this I want to talk about is Peter Townsend's Poverty in the UK. And this is in your pack um, and you've got a full description. But ultimately, the study highlighted that there was a significant level of poverty in the UK directly and, and indirectly caused by social policies of the time. So basically, Townsend pioneered this research into relative deprivation. And he said that living standards in the UK, um, well, was he worth studying? He looked at material and social changes. And what he found, as it says in this quote here, that individuals, families and groups in the population could be said to be living in poverty if they lack the resources to obtain the types of diet, participate in activities and have the living conditions and amenities which are customary or at least widely encouraged or approved in societies they belong. Their resources are so seriously below those commanded by the average individual or family that they are in effect excluded from ordinary patterns, customs and activities. So that was Townsend's measurement. And what he found was that, that there was a high level of deprivation in society. And this is obviously people living with poverty. And he developed a massive list of 60 indicators um, which were used to study whether people lived in poverty. And, and this was done in, in 1968, 69, with a, a relatively large sample of about 2,000 homes. Now, those measurements haven't really changed. And if we think about society today, bring it a little bit more contemporary, in 2017-18, uh, it was estimated that 14.3 million people in the UK were living in poverty. So that's, that's quite a big proportion. About 22% of the UK population are in poverty. 34% of all children are living in poverty. And there's this just half or just under half, 49%, are in persistent poverty. So, you know, they're always living in poverty. Now, this is one of these social issues. This is an issue in society. Poverty is a problem. And part of it is caused by policy. Policy could be brought in to make the changes. Now, poverty rates fell in the years after 2010 as the UK recovered from the financial crisis. They're starting to improve. But what we've also seen are a number of policies which, which kind of caused poverty. So as you can see here, poverty in the UK as a measurement is quite high. You know, there's a lot of people living in poverty in terms of the UK standards. So we're just just above the EU average uh, income in terms of poverty. We're just scraping through. 
And again, this video is really worth looking at. Again, I'll put the link in the description. Um, so austerity, the government's measure or use of austerity measures of cuts was a major cause of poverty. And the UN Rapporteur on Poverty and Welfare came to the UK to look at the poverty crisis. And his determination was that austerity inflicted a great level of misery and poverty and, and even deaths on the UK. And what he said was, his quote was, it was an ideological project causing pain and misery. misery. So the poverty crisis was caused by policy and actions. To extend it further, if we think about universal credit, universal credit has had a massive impact in causing poverty. Uh, the switch to this system was meant to make it easier to, to sort of the welfare system, to make it fairer. But actually, in most cases, in almost all categories, um, people are losing money or more people are, are out of pocket because of the switch. And it's not because they've done anything wrong. It's the way that these systems are introduced. So there's been a lot of calls now to remove universal credit. So as we said at the very beginning, how does sociology influence social policy? Now, we've got the, the three points here that highlight blue. These are the points that Giddings mentioned earlier. So cultural awareness, self-awareness, and evaluating the effectiveness of a policy. Some additional impacts would be change in assumptions. So McNeil says that research by sociologists can change those taken for granted, those negative stereotypes or those labeled assumptions that we have about a culture, a group, or an individual. It can provide a theoretical basis for policies that are adapted by governments. It can provide the practical and professional knowledge to support social policy. So for example, government policies being introduced, so they might get experts to do some research to find out the impacts and, and as a result, that might change the way a policy is implemented. We're gonna put some examples on in a second. But also it can identify the problems. What are the causes and the solutions to problems in society? Now, again, sociology can put this information forward. Whether it's adopted by government is a very different argument. So is there a trust in politics? Now, these two images will show you that there isn't really much trust in politics and politicians. Uh, a lot of people feel that the government don't do what they say or won't do what they say or maybe don't trust them. the kind of the most trusted professions would be doctors and teachers. Um, but you can see here these kind of differences because people don't trust politicians. So when it comes to the formation of social policy, sociological impact is a very small element of that. So the contribution of sociologists is one of the factors, but you can see the remaining factors is you know, financial constraints, ideological, uh, the role of the media, pressure groups, lobbying groups, uh, police and different political, um, or oh, sorry, public bodies. Uh, so, you know, policy formation does consider sociology, but it's a very sort of, it's one element of it. It's not the sole factor in deciding the policy. So governments do not always take account of the action. I've got two examples here of sociology putting some ideas forward and the government acting on it or ignoring it. So in the 1980s, the Thatcher put forward the Black Report. Oh, sorry, uh, the Black Report was published in the 1980s. Now this was initiated by the previous Labour government in 1977. Thatcher came into power in 1979. The report was ready in the 1980s and it was the looking at poverty in the UK. Now, the policy would have not looked great for the Conservative Party. Um, it highlighted that, that poverty was an issue, that there needed to be significant contributions to welfare support, to hospitals, and it, it kind of went against the Conservative agenda. So what happened was the report was delayed and it was published on a bank holiday weekend when Again, in the 1980s, there wasn't the, the level of news and information sharing there was today. So it was kind of limited in terms of how many people would pick up on it. Only 260 copies of the report were published for the whole country. So it reduced the spread of the report and the government ultimately ignored the findings. The Akerson report 
was Blair, that was 1998. Now, this was a very similar process. Um, there were a number of concerns about health needs in the UK. And one of the things that Labour introduced as part of its, its pledge to become government was that it was going to design a review and look at inequalities in health in England, identify priority areas and create policies to reduce them. Now, loads of reports were published. Uh, and one of these reports was that Our Healthier Nation report um, and the white paper to improve the health gap or reduce the health gap in the UK. And these policies were then initiated and incorporated into that government's agenda. So what we've got two examples of sociological research being put forward and a government responding to it. So there's some more information here on the Black Report if you want to read into it. And some more information here in the Nixon Report again if you want to take a look. So sociology and social policy, some points here. So other things that can influence social policy would be cost, so the government funding being limited. Most researchers, most money into research on policy comes from the government. If you're going to criticise that government policy, you may not get any funding. We also have the current focus of, or previously have had the focus on austerity. So there wouldn't have been massive of funding around. Uh, Globalisation has a big impact on policy. So Brexit is a, is a perfect example. Uh, America withdrawing from intelligence if the UK uses Chinese 5G networks. I think the, the, the rhetoric there has changed and that we are going to get 5G. The issue we've got now is in the corona climate is that people are burning down the mask because evidently in their mind 5G spreads corona, which is just madness. Political ideologies. So governments will use, ignore and distort data depending on their perspective. So we've seen this with Thatcher in the Black Report. We also think about the, the little extras, cash for schools uh, that was introduced a couple of years ago, um, or the Pretty Patel claiming that the government is not to blame for poverty coming off the back of 10 years of austerity. Um, electoral popularity. So they will ignore unpopular policies and promote ones to win power. David Cameron secured the Conservative uh, win in the 2015 uh, general election because he, he pledged that there would be a referendum on EU membership. He then had to hold up that referendum and it went not didn't go the way he was hoping it would. Uh, we see inequalities in power. So again, the people who make decisions have the power. They will often make decisions to support their power. Uh, so, for example, MPs changing definitions on what would be a home because at the time 123 MPs were landlords and property owners. And last but not least, demographic trends. I think this is a really interesting one and it does have a link to demography. So as you can see here, this is a difference between the voting pattern of young and old voters. So on the left, it says that if only 18 to 24 year olds were allowed to vote in the um, 20 19 general election, Labour would have won. There would have been a majority Labour government, 66% of the seats. If only over 65s were allowed to vote on the right, you could see that 62% of the seats would have gone to Conservatives. So age has a massive factor. And again, older generations more likely to be voting Conservative, younger generations more likely to vote Labour. One other thing just to talk about what influences political opinions is media bias. The media has a massive role in influencing politics, as we mentioned earlier. And what I've got here, just two examples of this, was two articles from the uh, Express. Now, I think these articles were about a month apart. So you had Boris Johnson's plan to raise wages across the country, getting a big boost from experts. And it was the idea that Boris Johnson was going to raise the minimum wage to £10.50 an hour and it received roaring praise from the Express. Now I think it was a month later Labour put in a policy or maybe it was the other way maybe Labour put their policy in first but ultimately Labour put forward a policy plan to raise minimum wage to £10 an hour and it got criticised heavily 
by the paper saying that it would cause millions of job losses, it would destroy the economy, it would put employment levels to um, record lows, it would be the worst thing ever. So you can see that the media can have a significant impact on policy implementation and actually even political swing. Um, media has a massive play, role to play. As I mentioned before, public opinions are some examples of things that I wanted to, to highlight to you. So uh, political parties may introduce policies to try and improve popularity from their government. Now, one of the sort of common political footballs in this area would be crime, the NHS and education. On the right here, you can see this was the little extras that was suggested by um, Philip Hammond. And he was going to give the schools a little extra money, um, despite the fact that um, he had spent years, or the Conservatives spent years savagely, savagely cutting education. So this four hundred million pound gift wouldn't cover anywhere near the the money that had been cut from schools already. And a lot of teachers, a lot of uh, newspapers, kind of criticised this little extra policy. It was a bit of a foul by the government there. The other one was the hostile environment. So getting tough on illegal migrants and driving the, the van, you can see on the left, around London, um, threatening to defy, uh, deport people or getting people to, to text in or give tips to anyone they think was an illegal citizen. Um, these would be policies. Now, the, the illegal vans, you know, driving around at the time, fit in with a tough on crime, tough on migration stance of the government. Looking back at now, it's just horribly... Uh, offensive, but at the time it, it got some craze because it was seen as that tough on crime, tough on illegal migration stance. And back to theoretical perspectives. Now, again, this is in your pack. I'm going to leave you to read this. You can look at the mind map and get some clues from there. But ultimately, what do the theories say about policies? As you can imagine, the, the theory fits their bill. Functionalism, probably very positive about policy for the good of society. Marxist supports the bourgeoisie. Feminist supports men. So um, take a look at what the theories have to say about policy. And in terms of postmodernism in the political era, just some uh, kind of again, some stuff that came up from the most recent 2019 election or some points I wanted to flag up about the role of new technology in influencing political campaigns. Now, just some again, some research here I did. So the Conservatives spent quite a considerable amount of money pushing their campaign, targeted adverts, adverts being put into particular areas. Um, you know, it was um, costing around £10,000 for these adverts, and then they throw extra money in to target particular groups. Uh, Labour didn't spend as much money on their online campaigning, um, but they kind of put campaigns out that was about some of their policies about costs for medical equipment and the, the threats of tr uh, trade deals with Trump. And Liberal Democrats, again, they they kind of did put a lot of policy out that were viewed by a fair number of people, um, but again, trying to put forward their promise of how they can stop Brexit. They were very anti-Brexit as a policy. But again, this is the, the maybe some of the new age uh, postmodernism arguments about policy and the influence now of social media in campaigning. So let's start wrapping up. So does sociology influence social policy? It does, because sociological problems can be highlighted and shared as social problems. Sociology can provide insight and help solve the problem. Sociological research does influence policy in some cases. Thinkers like Giddens and Murray have been influential on the sort of big parties in the last sort of 20, 30 years, so new Labour, new right. Research by sociologists can form policy, like the Aikerson report, and the empirical evidence that sociologists gather is used by government and policies. It doesn't have an impact because these problems and sociological research is not always considered, acknowledged, or receives any government or public attention. There is a lot of disregard by sociology, uh, for sociology by political powers who criticise the subject as been unsignificant. I will put a, um, a slide up in a second to demonstrate that. Ideological preference, so favouring left or right policy approaches will affect policy. 
the wider political climate, so Brexit, project fear, globalization. We see conflict theories to have policies work in the favor of powerful groups like the rich and generally men and democratic uh, democratic demographic patterns. So young and old voters, they have a big impact here. Now, in that terms of the views of political parties, this um, quote here is quite significant. Now, Dominic Cummins, who's currently Boris Johnson's uh, kind of lead senior advisor, he, before working for Boris, he worked for Gove in the education department. And he produced this, this big 250 page manifesto argument, basically talking about um, education and ultimately the waste of money that is being put into education to try and teach the underprivileged, poor, and particularly thinking about some of these subjects. So in this quote, in the middle, it says, uh, in, the middle it says in my, sorry, in many third rate higher education institutions, there's a large amount of social science work in economics, anthropology, sociology, literary theory, and so on of questionable value, both from intellectual perspectives and from the perspective of students, jobs and prospects. So ultimately what he's arguing is that some of these subjects like sociology are um, pointless. Um, and you know, this argument about genetic measurements as opposed to social ones. So uh, again, sociologists can put ideas forward, but if the people in power disagree or dis devalue the subject, it's not necessarily going to get anywhere. Okay, so should sociologists be involved in social policy? So just some summaries here. Comps, Durkheim and Marx all point that sociology is a way to improve society. So yes, we should. Positivists would say that the role is the main objective and value free. So again, policy, sorry, social policy should be influenced by sociological research because it is objective and unbiased. Feminists, particularly liberal, have seen ways of pushing equality for women by getting involved in politics. It can be necessary for funding because the government is the biggest funder of research. It ensures that social policy does take account of sociological evidence and look at the facts. And it does reduce the impact on vulnerable groups by getting sociological research involved. People who say no would be that the funders can constrain what sociologists do. There are ethical challenges, objectivity problems, particularly if you're receiving funding from the government who want you to research a particular topic. There might be compromises uh, put on your research. Postmodern, this suggests that sociology should not be involved in politics because it provides uh, an interpretation of the world rather than objectively studying it. And any successful use of sociological evidence affecting research would be the sociologist imposing their reality on others. So these are the arguments for yes and no. So to summarize, sociology helps policymakers shape policy and the needs of individuals in society. It enables policy to have these taken for granted assumptions changed and sociology is used to evaluate existing problems and assess how effective they can be in adapting and changing. As some exam tips, questions on the relationship between social policy and sociology um, are fairly straightforward. I think in most questions, they're kind of asked to identify uh, the contribution of sociology, the influence, different perspectives, views on policy, or whether sociology should or should not be involved. They're fairly fixed topic areas. To gain marks, you need to give examples of a particular policy draw on research from other topics you've studied, like family, education, poverty, crime. Evaluate the contribution of the sociologist. So are there other influences? Is policy influential? What else can we put forward? And think about postmodernism as a critical view. You know, the idea that politics is changing, society is changing, some of these older views on how policy and sociology relate do they still apply? We're in a very crazy time, politically, socially. It's worth highlighting that. That could please examiners in the right question. And here are some examples, just to demonstrate what we're talking about here. So some 10 markers here, um, two reasons why sociological findings may be unable to influence policy. 
So ways in which so policy makers will not listen to sociology. Uh, two ways sociology contributes to social problems. So what does sociology bring to the table? Two reasons why some sociologists suggest researchers should not be involved in assisting governments in forming policy. So this is again two arguments why sociology should not become involved in policy creation. And the 20 marker here is which sociological research may have an influence on the formation of policy. So ultimately it's kind of arguing to identify policies and how sociology may have influenced or how it could influence that policy creation. And there we have it, that is policy and if we're in the right place, theory and methods pack completed. So now you can just sit back and relax, just like a good friend, Reese Mark. Okay, thanks for watching. Hopefully this helped you with your pack, with the topic. I know it's been a slightly longer video, 40 minutes, so hopefully you took a break and didn't watch it all in one chunk. Um, I'm sure 40 minutes of my chatting away wasn't as exciting as I hoped it would be. Okay, thanks for watching and take care.